Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Lamentations 3, verses 22 through 24 to your fellow redeemed. Your God is too small was a theme that a professor used at Emmanuel Lutheran College when I went there in the late 90s. Uh, He found the theme in some random book in the seminary library, and he loved that theme, and so under the direction of scripture, he based a number of, of chapel devotions with it. The theme, which in essence he was saying, don't make your God too small. The theme in and of itself begs an incredibly relevant and practical question to all people, especially those of us who confess Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And the question that we have to look back again on ourselves is, do I do that? Do I run the risk, the danger, in fact, am I right now making God too small? Do I look at the the awesome power, the vastness of God's holiness, his love, and do I shrink God? Am I shrinking God? Do I shrink him to almost, in essence, a mortal man? Or do I shrink him down to maybe a superman, but not the all-powerful God? Could I be charged of that? I mean, it happens so easily, this whole shrinking God. Just a few examples. We, We make God too small when we look at him and We see his law, right, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and we think, well, these are nice recommendations, God, but I got the serious business of living, and therefore I cannot follow these as you command. Or we shrink God when we realize that he truly is angry over sin, and his righteous anger will find its justice. Or we shrink God when we don't look at God as the absolute forgiver of our sins and desires that all people come to him and have this righteousness and peace through Jesus We make God too small when we look at our problems and we say, I don't know if God can help me. Or maybe God's disinterested. Kind of like he winded it all up and he let it go. Here's my life. Today we're going to talk about how we can make God too small under the direction of this sermon text. And this is such an issue, such an issue to the sinful human condition, making God too small. Especially in this area that one might think, No, that's just life. I'm not really making God too small when it comes to this particular area. Now, as you know, we are moving through this final phase of the second part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is recorded for you in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We are now at the end of chapter 6. Jesus has been discussing this with us. He has told us, you cannot serve two masters. You will have a master. Will it be God or will it be something else? Jesus speaks this absolute truth that where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And that, of course, will be the driving force in your life. What is it? What is it that captures your imagination, that captures your attention? What is that? I left you with that point to ponder. Is it Jesus? Is he the treasure of your heart that captures your allegiance, your heart and imagination? Jesus now continues this line of thought. And he's saying that if we supremely treasure something over him, then that will drive us. That'll be our treasure. And what's going to happen is that treasure will leave us broken and shattered and a mess. That's what's going to happen to us. How you might ask, how could if I supremely treasure something other than Jesus? Well, what Jesus is saying is you will move or you will follow what you supremely treasure and you'll take other priorities in life and you will move those around to seek out that treasure or make good on that treasure or to live at a level that you think you should live at or even get close to the treasure. What happens when that's not Jesus is more often than not you're filled with some kind of anxiety and worry about that treasure. Am I getting to it? Am I getting closer? Am I keeping it? Am I really, really satisfied with this treasure? And it it brings this anxiety and ultimately it either makes God too small or God is completely replaced, which is an absolute shame because there's nothing on earth that can do what God can do. There's nothing on earth here, even the good things, that can offer you what Jesus offers you. Look at Jesus. Your sins are erased in the eyes of God. Your permanent record is clean before God because of Christ's blood and righteousness. When Jesus speaks to you, he speaks to you and offers you this ultimate comfort that stretches into eternity. Nothing else can give you that. 
Jesus promises you the happy ever after, and it's real. It's real. Jesus brings you back into the relationship with God the Father. You're in his presence because you're forgiven of your sins and you're accepted as one of his. Just think about that. That's huge. This is huge. Say you owe a debt to let's some, some foreign country. Say you owe them a huge debt and therefore they could imprison you or punish you or do whatever, whatever it is to you. Okay, you owe this huge debt because you committed a crime against them, and they say you're forgiven of the debt. You're released. Now, that's great, but that means you're released. You're, you're not put in prison, but yet you're still not part of that country. You still necessarily can't go there and be one of them. You're still a foreigner. Here's what Jesus is saying. You're forgiven of your sins, and you're brought into God's family. You're one of God's own. You're part of his country. You're one of his children. That's what Jesus has done for us. That means then that the all-powerful God is interested in you. That means that the all-powerful God's affection is directed toward you. That means that when God gives you a promise, God will keep the promise. That's what we read about in Deuteronomy and then applied it to David. That's what Paul is reassuring us of that truth. God keeps his promises always, always. Which then brings us to this question that we're going to consider in the sermon text. Am I making God too small in my life? Am I making God too small in my life when I start questioning whether or not he is really going to provide for me? Whether or not he really does care for me? Whether or not God really works things out for uh, my best interest in those that love me? Am I making God too small in that he cannot do that? Jesus points out the folly of that sort of thinking. He points out the folly. He exposes this worry and this anxiety, and he says, at best, it just distracts you and takes you away from more important things. At worst, could damage and even destroy your faith. So Jesus says, put that away and focus on me. Here's the sermon text, Matthew 6, 25, 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So why do you worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that they need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own. These are the words of our God. God forbid that we would lose touch with the majesty and the perfection and the vital significance of these very words and start seeing them as common or tiresome or maybe irrelevant to what we're going through in life. Rather, may the Lord lead us to see them as the supreme treasure that they are, that the Lord releases his Holy Spirit through them. To that end, we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is true. Amen. We often like to talk about some of these extreme claims that the scriptures make. And here, this just seems like an extreme challenge. Jesus is saying to us, do not be anxious and do not be worried about these things of life. You step back from that and you almost think, okay, isn't that sort of like going up to somebody with a cold and saying, now don't cough, just don't cough. I mean, it kind of seems impossible. There's so much to worry about. There's so much to worry about. Yet Jesus is exposing some things that we need to take a very hard look at. See, what happens is oftentimes when we are worried, when we are anxious, that leads us down another road, a road we don't want to travel. Just think about it for a minute. Anxiety about finances and money, does that not often lead us down a path of coveting or greed or or stealing or some some kind of obsessive behavior because we have to get back to whatever financial level we want to be? Or think about an anxiety towards 
uh, succeeding in a particular goal. You're driven to meet that goal. Everyone else around you, you become very irritable to them, maybe abrupt, maybe brisk, or even surly about it. Or think of an anxiety about a relationship. You want to have a particular relationship with one particular person, so everyone else starts getting pushed away because you're so focused on that one individual. You're indifferent and uncaring towards other people. Or think about anxiety to how someone might respond to a conversation that is difficult that you must have with them. All of a sudden, there you are, you're worrying, and you get into the conversation, and you might bury the truth or even lie as to not have to deal with the difficult reaction. Worry and anxiety, I think we could say, is just such a gateway. It's such a gateway to to these other paths that we don't want to be on. But it also robs us of something of something right here and right now. It robs us of the blessed peace and contentment that Jesus gives us. I mean, ultimately, we're just taking God and we're making him too small to deal with our problem. We're saying, God, I I know you brought me to faith and I know you love me, but this situation, God, you've got to understand, it's vexing, it's difficult, it might be too much even for you. Let's break this down a little bit. In the text, you see the word worry. Uh, The Greek word actually has this idea of being distracted. You're distracted. It's kind of saying that Jesus is saying you're distracted, and you're distracted from probably others, but you're distracted from me. You see, Jesus acknowledges that we have needs in life. You have needs. You have needs. He lists them. What he's saying is don't be taken away by these needs. Don't be consumed by them. Another author said anxiety is like a wild animal. It comes in and it bites you and it chews on you and it keeps chewing on you and it chews you up and it drags you all around. Many of you who found yourself in those situations can probably relate. Yeah, it's kind of how it feels. Remember, Jesus is primarily speaking to believers right here. He's speaking to them and he's saying that I am your life. I am your health. The Father is going to take care of you. I know you need food and clothing. And when he incorporates the word pagan, he's saying that non-believers, these are the things they treasure, food, clothing. uh, They treasure things of this world. That's what this is about for them. But not you. No, no. You have me. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have the real treasure. From that treasure, you know everything else will be taken care of. He gives this very summary point in Matthew 6, 33. He says, seek first his, that is God's kingdom, and his righteousness, and these other things will be given to you. He's saying you're part of God's kingdom. God rules in you. God rules through you. These promises, then, are what you base your decisions on. You seek his will. In all situations that you are in life, you seek him. You seek his will. The Holy Spirit brings you this gift to know that God is a good king, the kind of king that takes care of his people, the kind of king that's interested in his people. Now, we've talked about this before. We have this standing with God. His righteousness covers us. We are forgiven. The Apostle Paul said it this way. God has made us righteousness. In in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he writes, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So first, Jesus is saying, this is what matters, and you have this. God matters. Forgiveness matters. Faith in Jesus the Savior matters. From that, you have love and compassion to other people. God's mercy reflects off of you onto other people. His goodness fills you up to overflowing, and that affects the lives of all those around you. This stuff matters. It doesn't matter whether you're eating lobster or you're eating McDonald's. It doesn't matter if you shop at Walmart or Saks Fifth Avenue. People matter. God matters. That's what's important. So when we step back from this text, this is an incredibly freeing thing. Jesus frees us from having these concerns of the world weighting us down. He frees us, absolutely. So he identifies really the source problem, the worry and the anxiety. It's coming from this one root. So we have to expose the root so we can cut the root out. Here it is. Christ says in verse 30, Oh, you of little faith little faith. You're making me too small. You're making the Father too small by being 
so constantly distracted or consumed by these needs that the Father already knows that you have. So first here, let, let's go with this. We have struggle points in life. We do. There's certainly seasons in life where it seems we're more taken and more anxious about things than other times. What Jesus is saying is, come to me, I give you a treasure that will never be taken away. Don't be distracted from that. We're being told here, when we are taken away, when we're consumed, when we're dragged around by the wild animal of anxiety, let's call it, when that happens, we're, we're operating in little faith at best, little faith. And we need to hear this. We don't want to hear this, but we need to hear this. It's sort of like when you go to a doctor and he tells you, or she, you have a serious health problem. Nobody wants to hear that, but you need to hear it. They tell you you have a seriously health problem. Now you know it. Now let's deal with it. So Jesus is exposing the problem of worry and anxiety and saying, you know it. Now let's deal with it. The second thing here is just because you worry at times, just because you, you get anxious at times, doesn't mean you've lost your faith. Doesn't mean you've totally rejected Jesus and ran away. What it means is just the opposite. It shows you how Satan wants to get you away from God. He wants your attention off of Jesus and onto other things. He wants your attention off of the kingdom of heaven and onto the flesh. He wants you to go deeper and deeper into yourself, what you need, what you think you need, what you want others to think about you, either and whatever it could be. It could be your own image with other people. It could be your career, whatever it is. Jesus wants you focused on you and not on Jesus. We're like a car traveling down a road. And when we worry, it's like mud being thrown on our windshield. Just because there's some mud on your windshield doesn't mean you're on the wrong road. Doesn't mean you're necessarily off track. It means you have to turn on your windshield wiper to clean it off. And that's, again, where we come back to Jesus. That's, again, where we fix our eyes on the Savior who loves us, who cares about us, who's there for us. That, again, is why Jesus says to us right here in the text, he picks it up in 26. He knows we're going to have worry. This is a sinful world. We have our sinful flesh. He knows that. So he says this. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field and all his... Sp See the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? This is an incredibly clear picture. So let's put ourselves into the moment for a second. Jesus is at the mountainside. He's speaking to people, primarily peasants. And probably these people, many of them probably did wonder, what am I going to eat tomorrow? Or maybe they didn't have anything to wear. Maybe it was hard to find a shirt. How many of us woke up this morning and thought, what? Do I have anything to wear today? No, we thought, what am I going to wear? How many of us woke up and thought, will I have something to eat? Rather, it's more of, what do I want to eat and what should I not eat? Because I'm eating too much of it. We have a lot. I've heard one person say that in America, the poor are rich. In America, by the world's standards, and that's true. We're rich, and yet worry and anxiety have not been eradicated. They're not eradicated. Why is that? Let me offer this uh, uh, point to you for why. Because stuff, health, uh, human relationships, success, they don't fill the void that only Jesus can fill. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying God knows our food needs. God knows our clothing needs. He knows our living needs. He's very aware of this. He points out to the birds of the air. And what he's saying is don't, he's not saying don't work. You know, birds don't work. I'm not going to, he's not saying that. He's saying, look at the birds. They're not absorbed in themselves. They work. They fly around, look for their food, fly to the next place. Work for what the Lord has put in front of you today. And don't be consumed by this. Don't be consumed by it, distracted by it. He points to the flowers. And by using the name of Solomon, Jesus is invoking this imagery of splendor and kind of grandiose and beauty. And he's saying, see how beautiful these things are? God is the one that clothed them. Not even Solomon could match this. So what is happening again is Jesus is completely freeing us from self-absorption. He's freeing us from this. He's saying food, clothing, what you need, God will give it to you. These are indirect things. These are indirect. They must always be indirect. First is God. First is his righteousness. First we focus on Jesus. We work. We take our, our recreation. We enjoy our family time. 
God brings these things that we need. God brings them. Keep your mind on Jesus. Now, uh, in closing here, we have to say, Jesus is not saying don't prepare. Jesus is not saying don't work. He's not saying become lazy. No way. Read the Bible. Christ uh, clears that out for us very much. Rather, what he's telling us is don't let your mind race around. Be fixed on me. Don't make me too small. I'm the all-powerful God who came and entered humanity to save you and bring you back to the Father. He knows your needs. He knows your concerns. Let the responsibility sit on his capable and powerful and loving shoulders. That in mind, we pray.